If you watched some of my previous reviews, you may have noticed I'm a sucker for Vifa temps. It was just a matter of time before I got this one, low DHA500F. It's bloody difficult to find one of these anywhere, and if you manage to find one, she's usually dead. The one I've got was advertised as not working, and actually she really wasn't. But fortunately, it was only a couple of dead caps and resistors. The most important part, the VFET transistors that can't be found anywhere anymore, survived. 500F is an integrated amplifier, and I'm about to find out if it's worth bearing the VFET badge. And as always, let's start from the beginning. And by the beginning, I mean explanation what VFET and integrated amplifier is. For those who know or watched my previous reviews, just skip this bit. It may seem like I'm obsessed with the VFET amps. Um, yeah, maybe I am. But they sound so bloody awesome, I simply can't resist. It of course applies only for the ones I've already tested. VFET or SIT or PowerFET transistors were developed by this bloke, Nishizawa Junichi, known as Mr. Semiconductor, and rightly so, not only he was pretty good at his job, he was so obsessed with his work, he was actually thinking about naming son after a transistor. On as in being Japanese, there were only Japanese companies utilizing VFET in their products. Yamaha, Victor, known as JVC outside of Japan, Sansui, Sony, and Hitachi. Unlike Yamaha, JVC, and Sansui, Hitachi and Sony also produced integrated amplifiers with the VFET transistors. VFETs have very low noise, very low distortion, and shorten on and turn off times. They say the VFET is as close to triodes as transistor work get. And from what I've heard so far, it's true. These transistors produce very warm and sweet sound, but unlike the valve amps, the sound is also very detailed. I hate to repeat myself, but these are one of the best amps, period. If I knew a world, you can hardly find anything better than this, at least in the form of a power amplifier. This is my first VFET integrated amplifier, so I hope it's gonna sound as amazing as other VFETs. The production ran only for a couple of years before everybody turned their backs on the VFET and started using much cheaper and easier to work with MOSFETs and BJTs. The VFETs can get quite odd compared to other transistors, and need very precise and flawless power supply, otherwise they may quite easily end up dead. There are basically two types of amplifiers, power amp and preamp. Power amp takes care of the amplification of the signal, while the preamp is there for volume control, additional inputs and outputs on slight signal preamplification. A good preamp shouldn't worsen the sound quality, while an excellent preamp can even make it better. So, integrated amplifiers are basically power amp and preamp stuffed together into one chassis. Integrated are more convenient, they take up less space and are considerably cheaper. But it also kinda means they are not as good as their bigger sisters, most of the time. There are some exceptions of course, but generally they are inferior. Then we've got a receiver. It's a type of integrated amplifier with a tuner thrown in. If you don't want to use the radio, don't even consider using a receiver. If the integrated amplifier is inferior to the power amplifier, the receiver is of course even worse. There's more electronics that can interfere with the sound, more electronics that take up space in the chassis, and thus less space for the amplifier itself. And if you want to lower the quality even more, you may try to find a cassiva. It's a combination of power amp, preamp, tuner, and cassette deck. Amplifier part, tuner part, or cassette deck part, everything's pretty much rubbish in this one. But if you need all of those for some reason, and you like space for more than one device, it's kind of where to go. Hitachi is of course Japanese brand and Japanese always produce the best equipment. Hitachi products are known in Japan as Low D, which is an abbreviation of low distortion. Hitachi makes about anything, some systems for cars, construction machinery, military systems, nuclear power generators, various electronics, etc. etc. What we are interested in right now are of course audio systems, amplifiers to be precise. They've made some extraordinary products like the first ever MOSFET power amp, which was supposed to be a VFET killer. But was it though? Or the excellent DAD1000 which has been cloned about a billion times? Unlike Sony's masterpiece that cost 300,000 yen in 1974, which is about 500 quid today, the 500F wasn't Hitachi signed by any stretch, it cost only 90,000 yen. Even though it looked very similar, Hitachi signed was this, HA1100. It's not that big of a surprise, but as well as many other Japanese electronics, the 500F was released only in Japan. 
She's not the most powerful amp in the world. She's got only 50 watts into 8 ohms per channel. But it's just enough for most home loudspeakers running at normal listening levels. Signal to noise ratio is not one of the best, only 100 dB, but it's perfectly acceptable. The distortion, however, is not so good. Well, at half the power, the distortion is 0.008%, which is excellent. However, at full power, it rises up to 0.3%, and that doesn't correspond much with the name low D. I tried pushing the power to maximum to test the fucking air, the sound deterioration, and unfortunately, I certainly could. It wasn't something terrible, but if you want to enjoy the music, don't push it too hard. If you want to use a turntable, you've got two phono inputs. Unfortunately, they're only for MM cartridges. If you want to use an MC card, you need some sort of external phono amplifier. And if you want to use ceramic cards, just connect it to the auxiliary or tuner input. Phono 1 is altered to 2 mV, and Phono 2 is switchable between 2 and 5 mV with this switch right here. Also, you can't play around with impedance, it's all set to 50 kilo ohms for both phono inputs. I'm a sucker for electronics made in 70s, I know it's a personal taste, but they almost always look amazing. All of these knobs, buttons and levers on the brushed aluminum panel look cracking. It's not the best design I've ever seen, there are better looking pieces out there for sure, but it's certainly pretty. What I'm missing though are viewmeters. They always kind of light up the front panel and make the amp look more alive. The piece I've got is the basic model. It cost almost 90,000 yen in 1975. And if you fancy the wood finish, you could have bought this wooden chassis for another 6,500 yen. Personally, I fancy the amp in the wooden chassis a tad more. She's solidly built. All the buttons, knobs and levers are firm. Nothing feels loose or knackered even after so many years. The power lever is quite self-explanatory. Just push the lever up, wait for the relay to click and you're ready to go. You can connect up to two pairs of loudspeakers. With this knob, you can either turn the speakers off completely, use A channel, use B channel or both. What is quite an interesting knob though, or function, is this. It works only when the speakers are connected to the B channel, which is indicated by this line here. But that's not the interesting bit. The interesting bit is why is there in the first place. Well, the amplifier allows you to bypass preamp, which switches the amp to a sort of power amplifier mode. And since the volume knob is a part of the preamp, you can't use it, it, it won't work. Like this, you may use some external preamp, or you have to control the volume for your sound source. And if you can't do either, that's what this level knob is here for. It lowers the volume level, when you have no other way of controlling the volume when the preamp is disabled. I reckon I don't need to explain what based on treble do. They work fine, you just need to enable them with this lever right here. I don't fancy using bass on treble on the amplifier, I fancy keeping the sound as neutral as it gets. Low filter is there for one reason. Anything below certain frequency is cut off, in this case it's anything below 40 Hz. That's good for getting rid of turntable rumble for example, which I never had a problem with or any lower frequency for the matter, so I never use this feature on any amplifier. Function knob switches between different inputs. Nothing special here. Same goes for the balance. Phone's output. I never understood why would anybody listen to the music on these devices using headphones, but almost every amplifier has got it. It's not a big problem, but the volume control is not very smooth. It's got only 22 positions, so if you feel like one position is too quiet and the next one is too loud, you're either out of luck or you need to compensate some other way. The backplate is not overpopulated. We've got a couple of sections here. Phono, tuner and auxiliary in the input section, tape 1 on tape 2 in the tape section, pre-main jumper and of course speakers. I'm sure I don't need to explain any of these, however pre-main jumper section is quite useful. If you want to use the amp only as a preamp, you can connect your external power amp to the pre-out, so the internal power amp is cut off, and if you want to use the 500F as a standalone power amp, you can connect your source to the main end and it cuts off the preamp. Speaker terminals are a piece of crap. They are not as terrible as the ones used in Yamaha's B2, but they are pretty bad. At first sight, you can see they are pretty dodgy. At second sight, on touch, you are actually afraid they will break off. On the outside, the chassis is quite cool. The warmest part is of course here, where the transistors are, and I wonder how the transistors themselves do. So let's have a look inside then.
It's bloody dirty, alright disgusting, but I'm not gonna clean it up right now. The amp is not chock a block with electronics and heat sinks, it's rather empty. It weighs only about 26 pounds, which is about 12 kilos. The channels are not separated too well, it's got only one transformer for both channels and it certainly doesn't scream top quality. These caps still look original, however it doesn't mean it's a good thing. Unlike the transistors, electrolytic capacitors lifespan is unfortunately limited. Depends on the usage and how old it is. Anything above 20 years is considered not good, but that doesn't mean they can't survive much longer. 500F uses Hitachi's own transistors, which were used only in this particular model. And that may be a bit of a problem, because if the transistors go, it's nearly impossible to fix the bloody thing. The sound is a tad disappointing, but on the other hand, it's surprisingly good. Yeah, it sounds a bit mental, let me explain. It's an integrated amplifier, and certainly not ironed, so I shouldn't have expected anything more than what I've got. Compared to the MRB2 or B3 which I'm used to, the sound is a bit dry and also sweet and warm. The mids or nights are not so clear and it lacks the detail the MRs got. Sound stage is a tad worse as well, it lacks the space and air, but the bass is deep and nice. 500F does everything worse than the MRB2 or B3, but that's quite understandable. That being said, for what she is and what she initially cost, she's actually exceptionally good. There's one part of the amp that may be important for lots of people, and that is included for no preamp, which is quite good. MM cartridges sound great, I can't say anything bad about them. However, to get MC cards to some normal listening levels, I had to crank the volume up to the half. It was a bit noisy, but at least it wasn't distorted. So she's not a perfect candidate for turntables with MC cards. For what she cost when she was new, she sounds really good, or to even call it excellent. I don't want to compare her to Yamaha's power amps, it would be unfair since she's an integrated amp. But compared to the Yamaha CA2000, 500F is very close. Today's price can go up to £2,000, which is ridiculous. I've paid about 1700 quid, and I kinda regret that, so I'm gonna let it go. The price is so high mainly because she's so bloody rare, but she's also an excellent integrated simplifier as I've already said a couple of times. Well, is she worth the money she costs today though? For VFAT collectors, perhaps. After all, it's probably the rarest of all VFAT amps that is. For somebody who just wants high quality amplifier to listen to music, definitely not. You can find better amps for lower price. That said, she's still a piece of history, on I'm happy to have been able to test her and hear what she's able to produce. I'm the safe for this vid. I should stop chasing the best equipment and just listen to the music, which is exactly what I'm gonna do right now. Cheerio!